This is a router. This is also a router. And this is also a router. But one of those routers is not like the others. You can't buy it at Walmart or on Amazon because I built it myself. Should you also build your own router? Well, probably not. Seriously, if you're happy with how your current router works, if you don't need any extra features, if terms such as DOH, VLANs, DMZ, DNet, and QoS trigger your fight or flight response, if you aren't interested in networking at all, you probably should not build your own router. I know it's a weird way to start a video, but I wanted to be realistic with you guys. Not everyone should build their own router, and some of you guys might be better off with other solutions which we'll discuss later on in the video. One of the reasons might be that the router provided by your ISP kind of sucks. It might not support port forwarding, custom DNS, UPnP, or any other features that you might need. Now I do want to mention that there's a big difference between your router not supporting some things and your internet connection not supporting some things. We're going to talk about that later. And if you want some advanced features like VLANs, demilitarized zones, split DNS, and WireGuard, a custom build router of some kind or maybe an off-the-shelf enterprise router is definitely a must. Then there's also the security aspect. A lot of off-the-shelf routers run outdated software that doesn't receive any security patches, which puts your home network and all the devices connected to it at risk. Thankfully, a lot of ISPs, at least here in Germany, have been getting better at pushing updates to their routers, so there's that. If you have a home lab or host your own applications on your home network, the security aspect should be even more relevant to you. With an off-the-shelf consumer-grade router, you can pretty much forget about VLANs, subnet isolation, advanced firewall zones, and other things. This is where going the DIY route or getting a more advanced pre-built router is definitely a must. Another reason to build your own router could be learning more about networking. If you want to get a job in networking, system administration, or maybe get a professional certification, or maybe you just like learning new things, building your own router and setting up your home network from scratch all by yourself could be the first step to getting some hands-on experience with that kind of stuff. The short answer is, it depends. Whether or not you can even use your own hardware will depend a lot on your ISP, country, connection type, and other factors. Since I live in Germany, I can only tell you about my experience with German ISPs. So in my particular city, we have two main types of internet connection, DSL and cable. In 99% of the cases, the ISP provides you with a public IPv4 address and port forwarding functionality, even on super basic ISP provider routers. I use Vodafone cable, and unfortunately my Vodafone provider router can't even do IPv4 port forwarding. Luckily, you can switch it into the so-called bridge mode, which disables the routing functionality entirely. In the bridge mode, Vodafone station basically becomes a glorified DOCSIS to Ethernet converter. You can simply connect any router you want to one of the LAN ports, get a global IPv4 address via DHCP, and enjoy all the freedoms and benefits of a custom router. That being said, you might be less lucky depending on your particular setup. Your ISP might not even allow using your own hardware, block certain crucial ports like AT or 443, and limit features like public IP and port forwarding to business plans, which are usually much more expensive. So please do your own research before getting yourself a custom router, and make sure that your ISP will not give you an unpleasant surprise. Basically, any computer that has two or more Ethernet ports will be fine. But we want something better than fine, so here are some tips for choosing your hardware. First, the hardware should be energy efficient. Of course, you can repurpose an old Core 2 Duo motherboard or a Sandy Bridge laptop and use that as a router, but do you really want to run an extra 40 watt appliance in your house 24 7? On a somewhat unrelated note, I would also advise against using DDR2 era Atom SOCs, even if you find one for cheap. You might think that since they're small, low-performance machines, they should also be low power, but no. Those can consume as much as 25 watt at idle, despite their miserable performance. Trust me, I had to find out the hard way. Of course, this also depends on how cheap the electricity is where you live, and whether the cost of newer, more power-efficient hardware is going to offset the lower power consumption. Second, the operating system of your choice should have good drivers for the Ethernet NICs installed in your router, Personally, I recommend going for Intel-based NICs. They're supported out of the box on most Linux and BSD-based distros, and the drivers have passed the test of time. Of course, you can go with something else, like Realtek, Atheros, or Broadcom NICs, 
but they're definitely less reliable in that regard and you might run into some issues. If the motherboard of your choice has a PCIe or mini PCIe slot, you can also buy a PCI Express Ethernet card and the same rules apply here. Intel, good, everything else, be careful and do your own research. Last but not least, I would recommend getting something that has built-in ASNI support. ASNI is basically a cryptographic accelerator that is built into relatively new Intel CPUs. And in theory, it should make the cryptography tasks faster and less hard on the CPU. At some point, PFSense, a popular router distro, also considered making ASNI support a requirement for running the new version of PFSense, 2.5, but walked back the decision later. That being said, you can get a system with ASNI support for pretty cheap these days, so definitely make sure to check if the hardware you're interested in supports it. Buying a cheap consumer router with OpenWRT support is definitely an option if you have a limited budget, but I would advise against that for several reasons. First off, you might want to use another operating system. OpenWRT is kind of like NetBSD in terms of portability since it runs on pretty much everything, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. Some people prefer PFSense or IPFire, and they definitely don't run on as many devices as OpenWRT. Second, in a lot of cases, consumer router devices have very little storage, as little as 8 or even 4 megabytes. Now, OpenWRT is pretty lightweight, but my installation still takes up about 56 megabytes, and that's with a very basic set of packages. So you probably won't be able to install anything but the very basic packages on your router with, let's say, 8 megabytes of storage. Third, CPU performance might also be a concern for you. If you're interested in building your own router in the first place, you probably want to run things like WireGuard, IPsec, VLANs, DNS proxy, ad blocking, and all of that while providing a stable gigabit connection to multiple devices. Most cheap consumer routers have single core MIPS and ARM CPUs in them, which simply wouldn't be enough for a lot of advanced routing tasks. And the routers that do have more powerful CPUs in them usually cost more than building your own. So there's that. Last but not least, a lot of the all-in-one routers are actually less energy efficient than DIY x86 routers, as you will see later. So in this video, we'll go through three most popular budget options for a custom router setup. A Raspberry Pi based router, a custom Intel Gemini Lake based system from AliExpress, and finally, a fully custom built PC in a mini ITX enclosure. We will compare the cost, performance, see what advantages and disadvantages every system has, and try to answer the main question of this video. Which one should you go with? Let's start with the Raspberry Pi based build. This particular system is a CM4 router board by Seed. Seed sent me this board for free, so huge thanks to them, but as usual, I'm not obligated to only say nice things about it, the company didn't have a say over the content of the video, and did not get a preview of this video before it was published. The CM4 router board comes in this great case, and the top part also acts as a heatsink for the CM4 chip, which is cool. Under the hood is Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4, and a custom carrier board which has two Ethernet ports. One of those ports is a pass-through for the built-in Raspberry Pi NIC, and the other one is an extra Ethernet interface connected via the USB. Unfortunately, this particular board doesn't utilize the native PCIe interface on the Compute Module 4, which does result in lower performance compared to conventional NIC. One of the advantages of this particular router is its size. It's very compact, even compared to consumer routers. It's also super power efficient. In theory, you could power it with solar energy or even use it as a travel router. Unfortunately, that's where its advantages end, in my opinion. The drivers for its pretty exotic USB NIC aren't included by default in the official OpenWRT builds for Raspberry Pi, but hey, thankfully my man Jeff Yearling has been hard at work contributing to the OpenWRT project in that regard. Instead, you're supposed to use the unofficial OpenWRT build provided by Seed, which is pre-installed on the CM4 router. It comes with a pretty tacky theme in my opinion, and what feels like all available packages installed at once. Seriously, there's everything in a kitchen sink in there. Because of the CM4's hardware limitations, the router also only has two Ethernet ports, so if you use it with more than one device, you'll have to get a switch. Not a big deal if you already have one, but still. Finally, the price and availability are also kind of a tough pill to swallow here. The Seed CM4 router costs 150 bucks on Seed's official website, and that includes the carrier board, the Compute Module 4 with a 32 gig eMMC, the power supply, and the case. However, at the time of making this video, the availability of Compute Module 4 is pretty bad. 
so bad actually that there are websites which track Steam 4 availability across different stores, kind of like with graphic cards. So as a result, you can't actually buy the router right now, but hopefully this will change in the future. Now the price itself is not bad compared to other custom router hardware, but considering that it's basically a glorified Raspberry Pi with a USB to Ethernet adapter, it also comes with all the disadvantages of Raspberry Pi. The performance of the USB NIC is not great compared to the PCI Express NICs, the software availability also leaves a lot to be desired, there are no builds of PFSense, OPNSense or other popular router operating systems for Raspberry Pi, and your only option is a custom build of OpenWRT with a ton of packages pre-installed, at least for now. Still, I think Seed CM4 router is pretty good for home lab experiments. It's also very portable and power efficient, which might be an advantage for you depending on your needs. Personally, I wouldn't use it as my main router though. Now, a more practical option would be to get one of those no-name router slash appliance boxes that are based on the Intel Gemini Lake platform. They're sold by different companies, but ultimately look, work, and cost about the same. I don't actually have one on hand, so I'm only judging it by the tech specs and reviews. But do let me know if you actually want me to review a box like this one. Intel's Gemini-like processors are kind of like modern-day Atom CPUs. They're usually soldered to the motherboards, they're also very power efficient, and the performance is more than enough for the router tasks. Gemini Lake CPUs also support AES and I, which I mentioned earlier, so that's definitely a huge advantage. So this particular model is based on Intel Celeron J4125, it costs 187 bucks for the bare bones bring your own SSD and RAM version, or 224 bucks for a version with 4 gigs of RAM and 32 gig SSD. What does this money buy you? Well, you get four Intel NICs, which is great, one DDR4 slot, a mini PCI Express, and an MSATA slot. It also comes with a 12 volt power brick and a SATA cable. Throw in a 4 gig stick of DDR4 for about 10 bucks, and a 16 gigabyte MSATA SSD for about 5 bucks, and you get a complete router for around 200 bucks. 4 gigs is more than enough for something like OpenWRT, which wouldn't have any issues running on a toaster. And the same can be said about 16GB of flash storage. Since this router is also based on x86 hardware, it would have no issues running an official version of OpenWRT, PFSense, OPNSense, IPFire or any other router slash firewall OS you throw at it. Since I don't have an actual router like this on hand, I can't tell you how much power this exact model consumes, but I do have an ASRock J4125 board handy, which consumes around 7 to 8 watts, and that is really low. Running this machine 24-7, assuming you pay around 32 cents for a kilowatt, will cost you around $1.60 per month. So on paper, this definitely seems like a great option. And you would have a pretty hard time beating the price like this even if you build your own router from scratch. Or would you? Buying from AliExpress has one major drawback, and that is delivery time. Now I'm a very impatient person with poor impulse control, so I decided to build my own router using parts that I can get my hands on quickly. This is Gigabyte IMB1900TN, a thin ITX motherboard with two Ethernet ports based on Celeron J1900. It's an older platform that doesn't support AES and I. The good part, however, is that it takes DDR3 memory, which is significantly cheaper than DDR4. This board also does not require an ATX power supply and can run off of a 12 volt DC power supply, just like the AliExpress router thingy that we were discussing earlier. Obviously, this is not the only motherboard that you can use for a DIY router. You can definitely find cheaper options, but this is what I found and I think it's a pretty good deal. For the case, I decided to go with this Emco EM150 Mini ATX case. It's made entirely out of metal and looks pretty good in my opinion. The build quality is solid and it's pretty cheap for a new case. I paid 25 euros or 29 bucks. If you have a Mini ATX case kicking around or can find a used one for cheaper, it will obviously work too. Next up, SSD. I wanted to use this 256GB NVMe SSD at first, because that's what I had kicking around, but ended up getting this 32GB M.2 SATA SSD. You can get one for very cheap, 10 to 15 bucks, and you can also use a 2.5 inch SATA SSD if you really want to. There's definitely enough place in the case for that. DDR3 sodium RAM is pretty cheap these days, like I already mentioned. For instance, you can get this 4 gig stick for 8 bucks. And 4 gigs would honestly even be overkill for OpenWRT because it's very lightweight. If you can get a 2 gig stick for free, honestly, go for it. Since this board only has two Ethernet ports, I decided to get this mini PCI Express dual Ethernet card off of Amazon. 
It comes with this nice riser cable and passes perfectly into the empty space on the back of the case. This is one of the perks of the thin ITX form factor. If you have a normal width ITX case, you will have some empty space left for the PCI Express peripherals. I fixed the card with this screw to what's supposed to be a hole for a DC power jack, and it sits in there pretty tight. I don't think it's going anywhere. This particular card costs $58 on AliExpress, but you can also just get a switch like this TP-Link 8 port smart switch for 36 bucks. I just wanted to show you that you can get multiple Ethernet ports even if your motherboard only has two. So at the end, this is what the price for this kind of router looks like. I made two budgets. Worst case scenario where you couldn't find any good deals and didn't have any parts laying around, and the best case scenario where you found cheap deals, used cheaper parts and could reuse some old components like DDR3 RAM. As you can see, in the worst case scenario, we do actually end up spending more money on this than on the pre-built router. But what about the best case scenario? Well, if you're sure to be smart, wait for good deals, and if you're content on having an extra box kicking around in your closet, I mean the Switch, you can save around $40 compared to the AliExpress no-name router like the one that we talked about before. This DIY router is also pretty power efficient. I'm gonna put the numbers here on the screen. Now at this point, you're probably wondering, what about the Wi-Fi? Out of three options that I've outlined, only the Raspberry Pi based router has built-in Wi-Fi. And if you were to actually try and use it as an access point, you'd be very, very disappointed by the performance. So I've looked far and wide for a Wi-Fi 6 capable Wi-Fi adapter that supports access point functionality. And the only available adapter is this Qualcomm board. It costs 114 euros without shipping or antennas and isn't available for purchase yet at the moment of making this video. Personally, instead of building the Wi-Fi functionality directly into the router, I'm using a separate access point from Ubiquiti. Unify 6 Lite. It costs around 100 euros, so cheaper than the Qualcomm card, and provides a lot of useful functions. For example, advanced statistics, analytics, and the ability to use different VLANs for different access points. So here's the comparison of all three routers that we've talked about today in this video. I'll be using the router that I've built today as my main router for the entire home network, and if there's anything to write home about, I might make another video on the topic. But that's gonna be it for today's video. Thank you guys for watching, and as usual, a huge thanks to my patrons. Mitchell Valentino, David Love, Edwin, Morse Networked, Robust Dream of Crypto, Prometheus, Laserbat, Catherine DC, and everyone else who supports this channel. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.